So um, I am really, really excited today to welcome uh, today Dr. Thomas Kanampalil uh, from Washington University School of Medicine, where he is a faculty and associate professor of anesthesia and computer science in the Institute for Informatics there, as well as having a number of other roles, both in their CTSA, uh, operational roles. Uh, he really is an expert and has demonstrated um, that a lot of uh, things that we oftentimes start as research, uh, you can actually successfully, with a lot of persistence and grit, uh, translate into uh, operations. And so I think that's one of the things that we're really excited to hear about. Uh, the other thing is I, he's got really quite a, a, a wonderful background, um, uh, initially as a mechanical engineering, um, uh, but then moving into really uh, applying this directly uh, when you were at UIC, uh, and then by sheer grit again and creativity, finding ways to uh, rise up the ranks uh, uh, you know, with, I think, was it two PhDs now or so, so, uh, and then, uh, becoming a faculty and again, rising very, very rapidly in the ranks, uh, um, to where he is today. And so we are very excited. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Ken Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you know, this is a second talk I'm giving in the last three hours. So, uh, uh, if I, if I, if you, if you guys can hear me, if my voice is a little hoarse, uh, please excuse me. So uh, thank you, Abel, for that wonderful introduction. I do not have two PhDs. I, I did go through two PhD programs, so uh, if that's actually equivalent. Uh, um, you, you know, I, I also say this um, often that I'm neither an anesthesiologist or a computer scientist. Uh, my background is in clinical informatics, um, and I have been in a, can you guys, oh, it's on the side. Um, um, and I've been in a number of roles, both both operational and uh, research, and my goal has been my goal has been on um, assessing um, or bringing things to the point of care um, as sort of a very pragmatic researcher at this point. So um, today, uh, to here today, I'm going to talk about a sort of a rather innovative pilot study that we pilot RCT that we done uh, did about two years ago, just got completed and just published about six months ago on the use of uh, an Alexa-based uh, device for delivering therapy uh, and sort of, sort of some of the pragmatic challenges uh, on using these platforms and running RCTs uh, uh, within, this, uh, within this environment. I'll get into some of the details. It was a it was a mechanistic trial. I don't know. Does anybody here have a neuroscience background online or anything? No. Uh, so it, it, this was a mechanistic trial. It had some imaging and all sorts of things, but it's, I'm going to talk about more in terms of the pragmatics of this. Um, okay. Uh, some financial disclosures, none of which actually affected this work. Uh, the grants, um, I'm not, none of these grants were part of this uh, study that I'm going to talk about today. I also want to say, I did talk this morning, uh, at least one of you were uh, at that talk in anesthesia. I gave the grand rounds at anesthesia which is primarily on sort of a related topic, but more to a clinical department, um, but not on the machine learning part of it, but essentially on the idea that everybody seems to be ready for uh, uh, AI, except almost nobody is ready for AI. Uh, uh, the idea, uh, the, uh, neither, the EHR, but who is ready? Who is ready? EHR systems and vendors seem to be ready, and they want to push things uh, out to you that are potentially not ready. Uh, and we're in this uh, in this hype machine timeline uh, where everything is fantastic and everybody needs to spend, I don't know, 15, 20 million dollars on ambient AI or whatever other new tool that comes to them. So and uh, essentially this hype machine actually ha has has us in this sort of situation, which is what I talked about this morning. The idea that um, implemented models, are rarely researched, meaning you get these black box. Um, and I give this example of Epic sepsis model that was tested at Michigan, which basically Epic said had 0 0.8, 0 0.9 uh, AU, uh, predictive um, uh, performance. And in reality, it had less, slightly better than tossing a coin, right? Um, uh, but it was implemented. Millions of patients have been uh, going through that, but it was a black box model, which because of the power of Epic, nothing else that you can say. It was implemented and now we're walking back. They got egg on their face, nothing happened. They're back, there are 15 models on the foundation models that you can download today. Uh, and we don't know how it works, right? And that's the challenge. But the axiomatic contrast to that is that research models are rarely implemented. 
how many of you here in this room have built a model? Like, oops, I mean, Abel has, yeah? And we were talking yesterday with the students about, it's not the models. It's the challenges around translating these models into practice. And this morning I was giving the example of a, a transfusion risk predictor, uh, prediction model, because who needs a type and screen before surgery? Um, and the model was super simple, right? It uses only nine variables. It took us three years to get it into Epic and it still does not work. And we are funding now for an RCT. My former postdoc now faculty uh, got a K and the proposal in the K is to run a, a pilot, uh, uh, um, a cluster randomized trial using the surgical transfusion risk for patients who are coming in for surgery with the type and screen order. Will it work? Yet to be seen, right? And, and the bigger problem, and, and this is what I was uh, talking this morning about, the, the, the platform and the, the life cycle of a machine learning project is too long. Um, and you start from um, you know, a model, typically you start from model development as opposed to a needs assessment because the easiest, the most sexiest thing in an academic medical center is to say, here's, we have a model. Um, but what does it take to, to take a model uh, from, from data to, to the end? And the biggest problem I will say is the last mile problem, the socio-technical, where the alert, what's, what are sort of the challenges in building uh, and implementing these models. And I can tell you, having been at least on three of these, um, these development efforts, none of them are even close to complete. Uh, and uh, from the, the other part of this, I, I will say, and I, I have long conversations with my computer science colleagues about this, they are not incentivized for that second half of the, uh, the, 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 the problem development. Their focus is on fancy models. We talked yesterday about, uh, you know, how many more layers can you add to a, uh, to a model you know, for, for prediction? How, how useful can it be? Uh, can you even implement it? Then what's the point? It's like the, the argument about uh, if a tree fell in the forest and you don't hear about it, did it really fall? This is the argument about models at, at this point. And, and this is the challenge in terms of platforms that we need to think about. Epic has a cognitive compute platform. Is it available here at Northwest? Uh, yeah. Uh, has anybody attempted to build anything on it? <laughs> it doesn't, I, I can tell you having worked over the last three years, in theory, it works. If you have three variables and those variables get updated once a month. Um, <laughs> um, okay. Um, oops, sorry. So uh, again, so what I talked today is basically about research. What what makes implementing research models really difficult? And I was trying to give you know the 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 sort of um, uh, uh, a literary genius of our times, Taylor Swift, uh, ha ha has uh, uh, sort of guidelines in, in terms of what what makes this challenging. And I was talking about. Band-aids don't fix bullet holes. Uh, and that essentially is the problem that we are dealing with today. The entire Epic infrastructure or Epic integrated infrastructure or even external infrastructures that, are, that have been created are held by Band-aids. And that's why the CCP platform does not work because there's no incentive from Epic or from academic institutions to implement it because you'd rather spend $15 million on buying the product uh, from third parties or connect to third parties in order to build it. Um, and I know we have Yuan in the room who's, who's an expert at some of these things, right? Like, so these are the kinds of things that we need to think about essentially the, the latter half of the, of, the problem, uh, of the problem if we need to make change as implementations and also broadly health services researchers uh, in order to change clinical practice and to make a dent uh, in creating outcomes. So that's my sort of two cents this morning. I was talking to a purely clinical audience. Um, so I do not know how much they got the value of this sort of um, uh, approach. But I'll just pause there for a minute before I get into my talk. Any thoughts, questions? Because this, I think several of you have thought about this in different ways. There is some questions that I can't see it, Tim. Those are messages. <laughs> All right. All right. So let me get to the talk today. Uh, so this was a this was an NIMH funded project when I which started when I was still at UIC. 
uh, with Junma, um, uh, who's in medicine. Uh, and the idea was that she she had developed this whole uh, process of human uh, coach-based studies for uh, comorbid depression and um, anxiety and also weight loss, which is this this study, this uh, mechanism called problem-solving therapy, uh, which is a, a coach-guided but patient-run uh, therapy mechanism, which has been shown efficacy in a number of settings, especially in depression and anxiety. And the goal of this broad goal of this project, and I'll get into some of the details, was to can you get a machine to deliver, at least create the guidepost in order to deliver this sort of uh, the, the sort of therapy? And this was the exciting time of Alexa being the solution to every problem that we have out there. And now we have figured out that even Amazon doesn't think Alexa is the right solution for anything except telling you what the weather is. Uh, so that's that's the world. So we're and that that that's the other part of uh, the AI hype. We are in highs and troughs very quickly. And it's very hard to see what's uh, what's the most important thing. So again, coming back to the topic, the prevalence of depression and anxiety has increased significantly uh, since the COVID pandemic. Um, and the, the the newest numbers from NIMH say one in three have some, some combination of depression and or anxiety. And, and, and these disorders are also complicated by the fact that we're, we're at a significant crisis in terms of availability of providers to, uh, to, to provide service, right? Uh, in order to get to therapist is significantly different, uh, difficult. And the challenges are exasperated by the, fa by the fact that uh, the, the, the effects are most acute in racial and ethnic minorities. They don't have care uh, uh, provisioned, which makes it uh, extremely difficult. And one of the, one of the, uh, the other things is that uh, the therapeutic solutions uh, are generally trial and error and almost of uh, people prefer um, sort of um, psychotherapies as opposed to uh, pharmacological uh, therapies. And their use is sort of up in the air and it's random mostly. So one of the efficacious therapy, uh, psychotherapies is problem solving therapy. Like I was saying earlier, it is, uh, uh, it's, it's not widely used because lack of uh, sort of therapists and also this low uh, reimbursement lack of um, you know, challenges with respect to patients just really uh, uh, making to some of these appointments. Mm -hmm. uh, if you haven't seen one of these in by 2024, you're living in, living in a different universe. Uh, um, there are uh, 50 different variants of um, every sort of product that's out there. And I don't know if Northwestern gives free access to some of them. Uh, WashU has like at least two of them, I think Calm and Headspace, it's free for staff and faculty. Uh, I don't know the use rates. Uh, they push it on us to say, hey, use Calm and it's going to make solve burnout problems or whatever the other sort of issues of the day are. So again, if you haven't seen uh, uh, these exist, these are um, sort of uh, uh, for-profit companies in general. There's some of it's based on research, some of it's uh, um, much more um, broad ideas. Uh, there's also not been large scale clinical trials of any any of these. We just know that people prefer to use them, not sure if it actually works. Um, the other part of this is chatbots, which is which has been the craze and uh, uh, but has not even those have not seen uh, large scale adopt, uh, adoption. Vobot was a graduate school colleague of mine from Stanford. Um, uh, it got a little bit of press. Um, it's a it was AI before AI existed. You could text and get responses. It was uh, it's a, Alison Druin. She was at Stanford um, before. Uh, it got a little bit of press. I do not know what really happened to the tool post la large language models. So uh, we're, again, this is again, some of the challenges of um, using uh, uh, these sort of uh, tools. But here's the problem. Um, there's so many out there that if you, there was a recent um, systematic review and meta-analysis, which basically showed that chatbots have uh, uh, the, the evidence, the evidence for chatbots and uh, for mitigating uh, symptoms are mild. Um, there's conflicting evidence on other situations, making, the, making, the, making it questionable uh, uh, in terms of whether these are efficacious interventions. The biggest problem in all of these studies that they're all pre-post studies or almost all of them are. So it's harder to read into what the, what the findings mean in, in a lot of these studies. And I will tell you, it's extremely challenging to run a clinical trial uh, from, these, uh, from these settings. 
uh, again, this was uh, in 2018, 2019, when Alexa was supposed to be the so pro uh, solution for every problem that existed, delivering therapy, talk to a therapist. Um, but if you really look at the evidence that's out there, it's all ideas. Uh, there's been a lot of stuff published in the use of these sort of voice-based uh, tools. And it's most, um, and I, I would say 80% of the studies that have been published have primarily been on, does Alexa give the right answer to a medical question? Um, uh, you know, one of my favorite papers was, um, uh, which basically was, was, was done with this uh, uh, user study with about 100 users. Um, and their, their, the, the, the takeaway from that paper was that uh, it's like a bad personal assistant at best, right? Um, uh, uh, and and that's that's actually a good reflection of 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 what the purpose was because it really is uh, is uh, is set to answer questions like what's the weather today? Can you schedule a meeting or add things to my calendar? That's the extent to which it's been said. It also is meant for uh, a single point task conversations, not like an extended conversations like a. Uh, uh, like a therapy, which 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 has broad sort of back and forth and sort of broad ended setup. And again, I wanted to show that there are some more broader uh, papers that were published. Much of it's uh, essentially very simple design studies as opposed to a full uh, 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 therapy. So the goal um, uh, for us uh, was to overcome some of the challenges. Basically, consumer based applications are essentially task based. The infrastructure is uh, as opposed to when we sub submitted the proposal, it's not designed for co uh, continuous conversations. Uh, it, it can, there's all sorts of rules. Like it times out after eight seconds, so eight seconds if you don't respond to uh, to a question it's been asking, right? Like uh, in Alexa or most of the devices. Uh, the technical infrastructure is kind of complex, but also minimalist. You have to rely on the infrastructure that's uh, provided. So we used Alexa, uh, you have to use AWS in a lot of things. And if you're trying to do a research study, uh, uh, it's integration with external things like a red cap or a Qualtrics. It just becomes extremely com cumbersome and complicated. But uh, and the 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 bottom line across all our reviews was that uh, uh, the literature review was that they're all rudimentary systems, none, no trials. So the evidence about whether this actually works or not is uh, didn't exist. So what we wanted to do uh, when we started the study was to build this fancy thing that can talk like a human and work like a human and almost uh, seemingly act as a therapist. Um, so uh, well, when we dug into some of those things, what we wanted to do was sort of um, uh, reduce the scope in trying to create some basic things that we can do. Can we do cognitively plausible conversations? Meaning that um, uh, can it can can sort of like the Turing test for a uh, for a for a device for a robot? Uh, can does it can a human interact with it? thinking that it is, knowing that it's a robot, but it's seemingly real, right? Uh, acknowledgements, um, understanding sort of a structure. So in some ways, this was this was a philosophical exercise in designing conversations rather than designing a robot. Uh, and these are sort of the pragmatics, and I'll get into some of this. So we, we wrote this paper in NPJ Digital Medicine on how do we design this cognitive plausibility, plausibility uh, of interactions. Um, and with, with that broad goal in mind, the goal was not to just to build something and say it, it worked, actually was to conduct an RC, a mechanistic RCT. Uh, that's why I was asking if folks are familiar with uh, so, so sort of the neuroscience background. Um, and, and also, uh, we wanted to look at the magnitude of both the uh, treatment effects on depression and anxiety symptoms, and also uh, uh, sort of set preset a priori neuro neural targets uh, related to uh, depression and anxiety symptoms, but essentially related to reactivity and cognitive control. I'll pause for a moment. Any questions? So we have uh, two comments in the chat. So Michael was agreeing with your point about the use of AI models in uh, clinical research or in uh, clinical practice. And he agreed that this is not only in academic settings, but also not, not, not yeah. academic settings an issue. And then uh, we have one other comment about the um, AI-based mental health tools you were mentioning. And uh, Maria uh, mentioned that this would be great if it would be also available to PhD students. That's <laughs> because we also experience some burnouts more than other uh, types Which of is people. <laughs> not just PhD students, any students. I have a teenager at home who says like, 
I'm anxious all the time. I have lots of lots of homework, and no, it's 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 a fair point, right? I mean, if you look at the burnout among students, uh, the numbers that are publicly published are among medical students. Uh, Sixty plus percentage of medical students have some uh, uh, one of the three components of burnout they 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 they, they have, right? Like, which is not surprising. Um, it's the world we live in at this point, I guess. Um, no, true. I agree. There's uh, another question from Michael Johnson. I'm uh, going to read it out. Um, we often talk about depression as it as if it were a homogeneous entity. Yep. However, there is obviously a continuum. Do you know where on this continuum the stats you uh, started on with, uh, like the 31 increase in depression yeah, because yeah. of pandemic issues where uh, these in individuals were? Yeah, so um, um, uh, I'm going to quote this. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm quoting this from memory. I, I do think that it's mild to moderate depression, not severe or treatment-resistant depression. Um, uh, so yes, it's, it's not like, again, it's just a statistics that was published by NIMH. It doesn't actually, um, uh, personalize the treat, uh, the, the, the treatment, uh, severity, uh, associated with it. Yeah. A and again, the study that I'm going to talk today is only, uh, the PSD has been shown efficacious only for mild to moderate depression, not with, uh, severe or treatment resistant depression. So for sure. Thank you for that. Uh, there's a follow-up question. Um, have somewhat depressed individuals become more depressed or are non-depressed suddenly reporting uh, symptoms of depression or is it uh, any of these self-reported? Yeah, I, that's a harder question. I do not know the answer to that. Um, sorry. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. um, we, we can talk about, maybe there's some other opinions later also in the opinion or uh, in the audience, or if you want to uh, share some other um, questions online. There, Fe uh, Felix has one other question about the your specific experience um, in the last mile problem. Uh, can you talk a bit more about that? Sure. Uh, uh, maybe I'll come back to that at the end because I'll just continue with this. The last mile problem to me is probably the 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 hardest problem in AI that nobody's paying attention to. It also is the least funded problem and likely to have least funding. Uh, I was talking to Abel last night. This, these are some of the problems that probably require uh, donor funds or some wealthy person who is interested in addressing some of these problems. This is not going to be funded by NIH, unfortunately. Uh, because they don't, they see these as engineering problems as opposed to research problems. And, uh, you know, you can't go to NSF because it's not innovative enough or method focused enough. You can go to NIH because it's not applicable enough. So who pays for these sort of work? institutions or hospitals? I don't know the, the, it's, it's, it's a really difficult problem. It's, it's, it's not an unknown problem, but it's a really difficult problem. So, all right. Getting back to this, um, um, uh, uh, so what we decided, what we developed was this um, application called Lumen. It's a voice-based virtual coach, no touch. It's voice only, um, and it uh, was designed using the Alexa platform. Um, and essentially, it was not just one session. We had to design an eight-session uh, therapy intervention, uh, um, and and the sessions had to be connected to one another. And the the idea was that. Uh, the PST was very amenable to this sort of approach because it's a it's a seven step process. Again, the 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 steps are broad and can be uh, are are basically guidelines, right? Identify the problem. Uh, uh, what are the causes of the problem? What sort of potential solutions can you think about the problem? How do you implement that problem? So this seven step process, um, uh, like I said, it's goal identification, selection, generating solutions solution evaluation. Again, all of this is on the patient or the participant in doing it. The role of the coach is to guide uh, the user in the process. And this is where I thought, where we thought that the, the, uh, the, the sort of electronic devices can, uh, electronic uh, uh, management can be easily uh, delivered. And the role of Lumen in this process is to guide the user with prompts uh, and sort of steps uh, within that process. And uh, like I said, the, uh, we are in a research group funded through NIMH, so you had to run a study. So this was not just delivering uh, the next great application to users and spin off a company, uh, but this was more on the sense of, can this work? So in addition to uh, building the Alexa-based application, we also had to build things around it, such that you can collect data, 
uh, and deliver uh, some of the some of the mechanistic approaches in order to do this. This is also a touchless trial, except for the neuroimaging visit. So essentially, there were eight sessions. Uh, every session, and the first session was sort of an introduction and training. Uh, they go through a list. They also had a handbook which they could write notes on. Uh, in between sessions, they were they could schedule, reschedule uh, all on on their Alexa app. They also had to do PHQ nine and GAT seven, which were indicators of which are um, uh, uh, indicators of uh, uh, anxiety and depression scales. They also did a weekly um, uh, e ecological momentary assessments related to stress and coping and some surveys at uh, the beginning and end of the study. So all of this had to be built in such that uh, they could do it. Uh, sessions two to eight, um, again, they went through uh, yeah, uh, every session. The, the, the structure was the same. Uh, but there was the seven step process identifying a different problem through the uh, at each of those uh, interventions. Okay, so given that, so now we had to think of a research solution within the Alexa infrastructure in order to make this work. So I'm gonna I'm gonna skip some of the details. This was pre large language models. So uh, if if you're gonna ask me a question about why did you use GPT, it didn't exist. Uh, 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 so what we had to do was design three things. We had to design conversations. Like I said before, this was a design of conversations than a design of a system. Uh, so what does that design of a conversation mean? Um, if I'm in a conversation face-to-face -face with any one of you, with you, Tim, uh, you can see me. Uh, so in addition to the things that I uh, speak, you can see my expressions. You can see nodding of the head. So what we create is what we create, what's called a common ground between two people in the conversations. There's uh-huh, acknowledgements, uh, things that, that, that exist. Um, and if I'm gonna speak for 30 minutes or three minutes and you're not speaking and I don't see you, I don't know what you're understanding or what you're gonna do. So that uh, this idea was um, Herb Clark from Stanford, he's a communication theorist, um, uh, came up with this idea of common ground, how people develop grounding in conversation. And it's a fundamental construct in a lot of clinical processes like handoffs or um, and how do you build ground grounding between participants in a conversational stru structure? And there are some certain structures on how those conversations are. So what we try to do in this human robot interaction is to create the grounding process as sort of the uh, creating a plausible process of interaction. And this plausible process of interaction is reliant on creating shorter conversational turns. So this was sort of the principles, right? The robot doesn't speak for 10 minutes. It speaks short one. And it, uh, because it, it, the human and the robot doesn't know what the acknowledgement structure is, the robot asks uh, specific responses. Did you understand? Yes, no. You had to choose uh, what option you wanted. Did you say yes? Sometimes, sometimes the, con the artificially created this conversation through, uh, through repeating conversations that the user spoke about. So that was the goal. It was not like, you know, in theory, it could be done in eight or nine turns in conversations, the whole conversation, where we try to split it up in such that we were engineering those conversations. And that was sort of a philosophical principle that, that drove this in order to create this idea of a common ground. Um, the second thing was uh, creating context in the conversations, right? So remember I said, this is an eight session uh, uh, intervention. Uh, and there are potential, as a human coach, you, you think about what happened last time. So you're, you know, last time you created this plan, how did that go? Right, like so, you had to create that into the context. You also had to create context related to things like scheduling, rescheduling. Um, uh, um, you know, things happen. You do not realize when we design this. We think of this as people sitting in a closed room with no disturbance and uh, doing this whole thing. That's not how real world works. Uh, uh, the bell rings, and you have to go open the door. So what happens? So if you're talking to Alexa, if you have more than an eight second gap, it shuts down. So if you ask Alexa, what's the weather and you uh, and you walk away and is that anything else you want and you have a gap, it just shuts down. So what did you have to do? What is human, co if you're in a room, what do you do? You have to pause the conversation. I'm coming back. And then, so we had to build in these things about pause and resume. Uh, then there's other issues. What if the internet breaks? And it breaks all the time, right? Like you're talking about, uh, um, and I'll get into some of these low-income households where the internet stability is, is, is a huge challenge. So we had to build these artificial things in that to make this seemingly real. Uh, so th th that was the second part of building context. And like I said, 
uh, we had to build these things because this was an RCT. We had to build things on um, uh, scheduling, therapy status. Uh, you know, people complete a survey, and at the beginning of each session, you t uh, the 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 device talk to you about like your PHQ nine has improved, your depression has improved. Uh, it seems like your things are working. So th things of context uh, uh, without that. And finally, the interaction. We initially thought this was going to be a we'll buy echoes uh, echo dots for people uh, for folks to give this out. 35 bucks. Unfortunately, that's not how these things work in the real world because you, you have all these pragmatic issues. We talked about like when I started this conversation about uh, um, not having uh, uh, um, you know, IRB and regulatory issues, the last mile sort of problem. Um, uh, where does the data get stored? How, does it, how, how is it set up? So how we did this is that we created this idea of a device as a therapist where we gave everybody an iPad, uh, like an iPad mini, and with all of these things uh, uh, integrated into it, I think I have a picture at some point, um, uh, like that, that was the iPad with the interface. They could not do anything else. They had all of these things on top, on top with each of the sessions. They just had to click the session, open yeah. the app. They also had a workbook, um, which they were given in order to write notes. Uh, they could, the surveys were sent uh, uh, within the platform as text messages, or they could attach their phone to the study, and it, it was sort of an integrated system. I'll pause for a second. This is not fancy, fancy, but it works. But it, and it took forever to make it work. Um, because like I said, it's all Band-Aids. Uh, any questions, thoughts? Actually, uh, if you go back more picture, then... uh, can you go back so it, uh, it seems that of course you can reiterate now that we have uh, large language models but uh, what if you combine it with the therapist so for example right now you could kind of like make sessions where they inter uh, kind yes. of connect and also you can add the rag so basically as the client as the client puts in data and they answer questions next session would be based coach, on human code exactly so you, you pull back from the history yes from the context i i just i'm just thinking no, as 100 you agree then there, there are five different variations you can think about this right like if, if you think that eight sessions with a robot is difficult yes it is difficult but humans learn very quickly and i'll get into some details about this but if you integrate it with a human coach in once in three sessions for example right yes that's actually setting the setting the stage again, and you integrate with language models and uh, re-change the, uh, the therapy structure. Exactly, because I, I think the one of the biggest challenge in especially the young therapists is that they don't know, it's not easy to switch from one technique to another, maybe exactly. sometimes on the fly, because clients are, uh, so that's one thing. Second thing, I don't think eight sessions, you know, like for, uh, uh, for therapy, people go one year, actually, maybe Without more. It and no readouts. Uh, so I, I, anyhow, I think it, it deserves revisiting for the 100%. same framework. Uh, and it's amazing. That's all. Uh, there are some, I have some other comments. Thank you. Thank you. No, no. I, it, again, you, we, you have to understand this was the first of, it, of its kind. When we started, we didn't know how it was going to look like. So this was building a plane uh, while it was still in the air. There is one more thing I want to add. So actually, you can add, you can add even voice speech to the yes. emotional, like people go in space, and even Russians did before. You could detect your yes. status just by the pitch of your voice. And 100%. It's actually lower level, system one or lower. Anyway. Correct. Yeah, and I, I, I want to speak to that one second, which is um, uh, the, the, we wanted to do that. In, in some of the models, at least in the post hoc analysis. The problem is Alexa does not let. There is open source, we can talk about it. Yes, 100%. And I talked to David Moore the other day about what he's trying to do with the same sort of uh, approach. And we talked in detail about what can be done and what are sort of the pragmatic challenges of actually getting it to work. Uh, uh, again, I, I want to say in terms of technical complexity, we could have made this technically more complex and sophisticated. Uh, but our focus was not just the technical, it was on the RCT, the pragmatics of running this. Okay. Uh, Thomas, uh, just a quick question before you move on. There's uh, one question from online. Um, if this can also be, or if this is also integrated in your EHR. It is not, but that is, um, I, I, I'm going to say, say that again. 
Um, my goal as a sort of translational applied clinical informatics researcher is that um, uh, the EHR lets you do only orders, pharmacological orders. Can you order a behavioral therapy at the point of care? It's never done and it should be. And these are the sort of techniques that you need that you can order, monitor, and uh, sort of longitudinally follow uh, over a period of time if we want to scale our health system. Um, um, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I agree. This is, this, is, this is the next step. But I, I don't think we can have that, those conversations till we actually show there's efficacy in some of these things, right? Again, this is uh, version 0.1 of 20. Uh, so there is things to be learned. Um, I'm going to move on. So we, we ran a small uh, pilot formative evaluation, which is where, what's that? A form, a formative evaluation where we, 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 um, we, we got it to run, uh, uh, essentially with, with two sessions and about 26 users. And the goal was not to test the efficacy, but more on what sort of things were going on. We made so many changes to the communication engineering and the design process in that uh, slow process. All right. Um, so again, the focus today, I'm going to talk about the RCT, uh, where um, we, uh, participants with mild to moderate uh, depression or anxiety were recruited. Uh, again, this was a pilot R RCT. Two new, uh, the only times the patients actually came to the clinic was at two neuroimaging visits at baseline and at 16 weeks for visit two and for, uh, uh, for their participation. They were compensated. Basically, the, the way I've designed all my clinical trials is essentially relying on giving them the devices at the end of the study as opposed to additional compensation. So they, get, they, got to, they got to keep the iPad and the devices, uh, which was exciting to, to, to lots of people. Uh, and there's another trial that I'm running, which is also integrated, not integrated, it's integrated into the EHR for weight loss, uh, essentially the same mechanism where we're longitudinally monitoring um, uh, with wearable devices, uh, Fitbit, um, and also with PSD as sort of an augmentation strategy. Um, uh, again, the same mechanism, they get to keep all the devices. Uh, it's a thousand person, three trial. And, and to me, that's the biggest um, wearable device clinical trial in the, in, in the world uh, after the All of Us program. The, and the All of Us is a bring your own device program. Uh, and yeah, and I can talk two days about the challenges of working with Google. Uh, they change their policies and platforms every other thing, every other month, and it's it's really hard. Again, back to this. Um, um, again, this was uh, like I said, this was a pilot RCT. It was randomized into the two to one ratio with the, with a weightless control arm. Uh, again, because it was a smaller study, the ra randomization, the intervention arm had a two to two to one um, uh, group. So eight sessions, like I was saying earlier, four weekly followed by four biweekly. All of them once they come for the getting their device, they go home, it's on their own, right? There's a sort of a technical support uh, if people fall off and things like that. Uh, this is sort of the mechanism. There was a session one. In between sessions, they had to do surveys or, uh, uh, for sort of uh, assessments, and then sessions two through eight. Uh, the primary clinical outcome was uh, changes, in, um, changes in depression and anxiety score from baseline to 16 weeks. Um, and the, uh, measure, the it was measured using the HATS hospital anxiety depression scale uh, for depression, anxiety, and total psychological distress. Uh, we used two neural target measures. Uh, this was based on Jun's previous uh, studies on um, on with with the human coach, and they established uh, pre existing regions of interest uh, for a neural circuit dis uh, uh, dysfunction for depression and anxiety. And this, the two specific was uh, the amygdala, the bilateral amygdala, um, and also the dose uh, for uh, uh, for threat, um, and then for emotional reactivity and the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex for cognitive control, both of which were uh, proxies for uh, depression and anxiety in a, in a number of neural target studies um, with collaborators from from Stanford. Um, again, I, the 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 actual experiments uh, are kind of complicated. Um, essentially, you lie in an MRI uh, imaging machine. Uh, you get images on top uh, for threat faces, um, and your uh, and that your images are uh, brain images are recorded, and then you're looking at uh, regions of interest which are fired essentially. Um, and there's a conscious processing, which is like you've shown a threat face for like ten seconds, versus uh, non-conscious processing, with which is like every a millisecond it's shown and does it actually uh, target. And the the argument here is that um, uh, these sort of brain processing. 
uh, uh, image, uh, uh, imaging activations are done uh, sort of subconsciously and it, it actually affects, uh, uh, it, it's regulated by your disease uh, uh, situation. Uh, and the other part of this is cognitive control, which is by the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is essentially showing these uh, press with the green and press with the red, and you have a button and you have to press a gr uh, press when the press is green uh, and not press when the, it's, uh, when, the, when the press comes in in red, just like that. So it's essentially go no go criteria. So if you if you have some sort of emotional dysfunction, you're likely to have more errors uh, in that process. Uh, it's essentially impulsivity, and impulsivity is a is a is a, is symptomatic of anxiety, uh, and and also depression. So, in addition to this, like I said, this was a mechanistic trial. In addition to this, we also had self reported measures, um, uh, which is basically the surveys uh, with respect to emotional regulation, which is the positive and negative affect and the worry questionnaire and sort of multiple measures related to uh, cognition. And uh, the statistical analysis, this was a pre-specified analysis. Um, we wanted to look at changes in depression and anxiety score from baseline to 16 weeks and the intervention and the waitlist control groups, uh, and also correlation between the changes in neural targets and the self-reported measures. So it's like a very complex uh, a highly pre-specified study. And because this was a pilot trial, we were used uh, Cohen's D, uh, pre-specified Cohen's D as a, sort of the main difference between the groups. Um, and we used a Cohen's D of 0.3 to, to define meaningful differences. Pause for a second. I know I ran through a lot of very complex neuroimaging. I, I, I'll be honest, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not a neuroscientist, right? I, I probably spend more time understanding neuroscience, reading basic neuroscience books, and reading about brain imaging in order to actually do this work. So it was uh, eye-opening. Um, you would think you can uh, adapt, but it's really hard. Neuroscientists are, they're good. Yes. This, this is a, a voice base. So how do you detect um, communication style, like the difference between communication style and the cultural difference? Yeah, the so way the, it's a great question. So I, I, let me just tell you the biggest problem with Alexa. Alexa doesn't, um, is not very uh, patient with uh, people with accents. So it breaks all the time. Uh, so yes, uh, the communication style um, it, it has even improved from 2019 when the study started to now in terms of how how it does, but it's a big problem. Uh, it, and I'm gonna I'm gonna say um, there there were people in our study who had slight accents and it would break and it would restart from the beginning and then we had to figure out various ways in order to avoid so again band aids uh, uh, to solve some of these issues. Um, so we randomized 63 people. Like I said, it was a two-to-one randomization, 42 in the control in the intervention arm, 21 in the waitlist control. The waitlist control actually, after the 16 weeks, they had the option to get uh, the intervention if they wanted to. And I think about four or five uh, actually got it. Um, to, to me, this was one of the most exciting studies um, because um, uh, you know the, particip the, the participant pool was, um, again, it was recruited in Chicago. Um, lots of minorities um, uh, uh, in the in, in in the group, and I'll get into some of the interesting things that we came. The most interesting part for me, in in spite of this being a fairly, I don't want to say rudimentary, uh, a band-aided uh, tool. Thirty-eight out of the forty-two participants in the intervention completed four sessions, which is ninety-one percent, and thirty-one out of the forty-two completed all eight. To me, that we never expected. So our go no go criteria for this grant was basically uh, fifty percent complete half the sessions. We just beat it by a mile. Um, um, so which is great. Um, and and I, like I said, um, uh, all sixty one were assessed at six, uh, sixty one out of the sixty three were uh, assessed at um, sixteen weeks. So I'm going to get into the uh, to the results and. If you want to get into the statistical me methodology behind it, I'm happy to. But I'm just going to point out the the big top highlighted points that I want to uh, I want to hit. So um, essentially, what we're looking at is differences between um, uh, 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 from zero to sixteen weeks as a difference. And, and as you can see here, at sixteen weeks, intervention participants had greater improvements in both depression, anxiety, and total distress sim uh, symptoms. Uh, and uh, all three uh, have met the Cohen's D pre-specified Cohen's D greater than three, showing that 
the symptoms uh, potentially improved uh, for in this uh, in the small group of participants. Um, what is more interesting, and there's greater improvements in depression, uh, uh, in depression, anxiety, and total uh, distress scores among women, those with college or lesser education, and among non-white participants, which is to me the most interesting finding. Again, it's a really small study, but it shows the value of even a fairly rudimentary tool uh, for those that do not have any access, even something has a potential benefit if they can get access to it. And this is essentially the, the, the sort of call I have about democratization of these sort of tools that can, that can have more wider acceptance and use across the board. Um, uh, in terms of neural targets, I know this is not a, a neuroscience uh, crab, but what we did find is that um, for the negative affect, there, there, there were improvements, um, but it did not meet the pre-specified Cohen's D. The only a neural target that met the was the right uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex uh, for the cognitive control, which met the Cohen's D, which showed. But all of the all of the um, uh, uh, the con uh, consider variables actually were pointing in the right direction, showing some uh, mechanistic relationships. Um, uh, again, same thing uh, connection with self reports. Both the positive affect and the negative affect uh, showed the same direction, and you can also see the prob raw problem solving scores and sort of. Um, uh, conditional solving, all of those showed uh, uh, um, uh, met the pre-specified criteria. Um, there's also association between the neural targets and the self-reports, which shows us some validity in terms of the neural targets were also, you can use the, the self-reports as proxies to, to some of these, showing the sort of the mechanistic value of some of these things. I'm gonna skip that, it's just too detailed at this point. The other sort of point that I wanna highlight is that the change in depression, so this is, this is a, this is a a graph which is showing the digital uh, literacy, health literacy score and the change in depression, meaning that the, the greater the change, the better it is, right? Like the greater the negative change, the better it is. Um, so you can see that those with lower uh, uh, the, uh, uh, health uh, literacy and knowledge about what to do, they found this, they found, had greater. And these were also people with lower uh, um, um, socioeconomic status and uh, lack of higher education. Um, again, uh, I did. I talked a lot. This was a very complex study with very many pieces that had technology, neuroscience, uh, uh, RCT, and design. But what we did find was exciting in, in a number of, uh, there was improvements in both depression, anxiety, and total psychological distress at 16 weeks, meaningful changes in a subset of the uh, neural targets showing promise. Um, Self-reported measures also showed associations. The, 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 the value of this tool, more than 80% of the highly diverse intervention participant, participants on a very rudimentary intervention completed all eight sessions. Um, marginalized groups with lesser access, um, this offered an on-demand solution, right? Like they did not have to wait for a, to finding a therapist or making the appointment or taking a day off or um, also transportation issues that, that actually are plaguing the current mental health delivery, uh, delivery system in addition to the significant shortage of providers. Um, this also highlights uh, sort of the, you know, the digital mental health intervention space is so crowded uh, with lots of hype, but uh, very little uh, pragmatic trials that are associated. So we do think that this is one of the first of those that to actually targeted uh, uh, um, but that's not to say that um, um, that's not to say there are there are not issues, especially we are dependent and reliant on external platforms. Um, but this is potentially a direction to study. Um, there's also um, uh, we just got another R one, which is basically looking at uh, to combining this uh, uh, with other interventions to to deliver. Because now we have a platform. It's the question of where can you apply it. So. We're going to aging and then going to NIDDK, uh, right? Like it's it's a platform, and um, the the availability of these platforms will will change things. And like I said before, this is not without challenges. Uh, the large language models have disrupted the field uh, pretty much in almost every scenario. Uh, we still don't know how to incorporate this um, uh, within sort of pragmatic uh, setup. So um, th there is considerable potential. There is, uh, there is no doubting it, uh, but the expenses and the cost associated with, this was the final mile problem that we attempted to solve. It's not the technical problem. So that's why I was, I was waiting to answer that question, right? Like 
but could not have done it without sort of the sound structures of a pilot RCT and the funding and the mechanism and the excitement about the problem by a, by a funding agency. Not easy if, you're, if you have a sepsis model, right? And that's the challenge uh, we have. Um, the paper was recently published. I've never got a 337 uh, odd metric score. We, I got calls from New York Times and it's like, can we use it? And it's like, no, it's a research. So um, it was pretty exciting. Um, uh, it, it went through three reviews at JAMA Psychiatry um, and they did not take it. Uh, and they basically came back and said, so RCT, will, when you finish your full trial, come talk to us. So the full trial is now actually going on. We are 175 out of 200 recruited. Um, so that has a, in addition to an intervention arm, we have a human arm, so we can actually test uh, the non-inferiority uh, component uh, of the trial. So hopefully soon. Um, this was funded, um, uh, we had multiple sites. This was funded by NIMH. And thank you very much for listening to me. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, I know this is not the traditional AI model that you would see, so I just wanted to go in a different direction. Thomas, great work. Thank you so much. I'm handing over for a question. Uh, thank you. So there are seven steps in the process, right? Uh, problem identification and then goal selection. Do, do, I'm curious, like what are the common problems they identified? Okay. And so let's, yeah. Common goals? So this is, this is general problems. So the problems have ranged between financial problems, marital problems, social anxiety, money, uh, children, uh, workplace, um, general problems that humans have, school, um, nothing fancy. But remember, the point of PSD is to give people a tool that they can learn. I mean, point of most therapy is to give people a, help people learn a tool uh, that they can use in another situation. So this is not about the solution offered for the specific thing it is that they're learning a mechanism on how to solve a problem that they have, which they cannot do because of their anxiety and depression and sort of uh, uh, um, distress. You're learning a tool. So yes, again, I'm not saying this is a perfect solution. This, this actually offers a start point to thinking about these sort of, uh, these sort of interventions. So there's uh, a question online. Um, I read it out loud from Donald. Uh, doesn't being rejected and being placed on the wait list potentially make depression worse? And uh, shouldn't your control be the usual therapy? Uh, yeah, I mean, sure, they can control. I mean, this was an RCT. This was a consented study. The randomization, it was randomization is blinded to the participants. They don't know whether they were randomized or not. Uh, they also d received a iPad. They just didn't have Lumen on their iPad. Um, it was a uh, sure there are ethics of uh, I mean in in a future study if it's if it's if it's shown value then I think you have to redesign the study in terms of how to do it because you'll have to think of a step wedge or these sort of some other mechanism uh, in the delivery mechanism uh, but the ethics of this was I think justified because we've shown no efficacy yes uh, usual care uh, uh, is outside of the scope of um, okay. of the study. Um, in addition to this, um, if they were, if the participants had other therapists, that was still happening. We did not control anything that was outside of this. So, yeah. So the control uh, had also uh, the controls got the uh, iPad too. Okay, good. So they kind of like got a fake kind of like application exactly. or something like that, but they didn't exactly they didn't get the lumen okay. part of it. It was almost like a placebo. Very good. Exactly. And now the number are it's higher because obviously the, the statistics sometimes it's difficult to tease out exactly. when it makes. Even ethnicity, age differences, uh, gender, all these are actually conf confusing. I know everybody wants equity and so on, but you have to do science first. And sometimes it's better to have a pure population at the beginning so you can tease out the, exactly. the, the, the technology and the readout, and then you go for others. 100%. So, so you have 170 uh, controls right now? No, no, no. So, so in no in the study, I know in, you have twenty. Yeah. Which... So in the in the actual studies, uh, it's a hundred on the lumen arm and fifty fifty in the human and uh, in the human and fifty in the control. 
There are some other things that we can talk yeah, about. Yeah, like, for example, we don't need Google. We don't need Siri. Right now, there is a way that you can do everything through a web interface, through large language models, which is encrypted, and you can customize it. Uh, we can talk about yeah, yeah, it. Well. So actually, it's not any more necessary. You can rebuild a platform based on the same principles, which is uh, kind of a vendor independent. Yeah, no, and that's and I'm sure that's where this this sort of entire field space will go. Um, the only concern, you know, in between when uh, we were we were actually thinking about um, can we do this? The the concern we had was we did extensive testing on this, and this is what we were comfortable with, right? If we yeah, even on the uh, the the efficacy study, we did not have enough uh, time to actually. NIH studies don't give you that much time to the intervention bill. It's like, go run, run, right? Like it's just very hard. Um, there, there's um, some other questions in the online chat. So the issue with developing a universal algorithm is that engineers often assume that people want to de democratize it and represent all groups, um, where in some cultures, they may not want to remove those sure. biases. Um, this is why transparency on how the algorithm is developed uh, is critical to trust. This is more of a hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, it's a yeah. No, I I agree. I I, I just don't think uh, uh, if you think of like an RCT, the uh, randomization and the blinding and all of those things that are incorporated, there is a balance that's almost achieved through the process. Uh, again, it's not going to be able to answer the specific hypothesis of it does it work for this ethnic group or this racial group versus another. That would need. Uh, a, a huge N and a huge expense. Uh, again, these are sort of challenges with uh, with the modern cl clinical trial environment. Like we're talking about equity in these sort of things, right? How do we make sure that that happens in a trial? It's very hard. Can you make the technology science for for the work? Yeah, it's it's yeah. Okay. Uh, Thomas, this is great. I, I just want to uh, applaud you. There's an, another last, last mile, which is what you've really been tackling, which is how do you actually conduct research in this area, uh, you know, in, in a way that is um, aligned with funding agencies? I mean, because yes. obviously when you're doing this, you had to have the idea, write the grant, uh, you know, uh, and we didn't get the know funding. How it was going to work right. Either. And so it's, it's, I'd be shocked if anyone was using like a large language model and running an RCT because the time it takes from the idea to actually delivering it is this number of years. So, but what I think what you pointed out is that you have a platform now that is, you could plug, and pay plug for, in new technologies and it's, it's relatively to swap these, these pieces in. I also applaud you for the ability to then combine that with the imaging, the fMRI. And it sounds like that part, when I saw that, I thought that's really quite a differentiator. Yeah. Um, and, and again, I think that's just clever use of, you know, you're not, you're not a neuroscientist, but partnering with people who have that expertise and then embedding that in, I think that was really, so just really just a uh, more applaud for that. Thank you. That. Yeah. Objective readouts. I, I, I love that DSM-5 is just philosophy, you know, like yes. there's no criteria quantitative readouts. And I think sometimes you need to bring somehow molecular imaging, whatever mechanism that is objective and, uh, I think that it's exactly the same. I, I love that too. I know it was way more that made maybe the experience very, very complicated. Yeah, but amazing. No, and I also think that as um, in 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 the, in the space of you know mental health informatics or uh, in in this general space, I, I I do think that from the science perspective, in order to attract these uh, these grants, uh, we have to think of these mechanistic ways to, to study them, and it's hard. Need also the baseline is very important. Sometimes you don't realize all of us have different firing as a baseline. Exactly. If you don't have that, it's kind of difficult to just yeah, separate with... like one week and then image them and then get conclusion that they are better or not. I'm just saying that, but anyhow, one. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and with that, um, we are right on time. Tom, Thomas, thank, thank you so much for joining us today, um, giving a great talk, and also. Um, answering so many questions. I really